Hi, good afternoon. It's a mystery. Um, and welcome to the Mershon Center and to our, I believe, final globalization workshop of the year. Uh, my name is Sarah Brooks, as some of you know. Um, and I'm very pleased today to introduce my friend um, and colleague, Professor Lena Mosley um, from the University of North Carolina at um, Chapel Hill. <laughs> Um, but first of all, we'd like to thank the Mershon Center for the funding and also Stephen Blaylock, um, who even wrote my script for me. Oh, I'm sorry, it says the fabulous Stephen Blaylock um, <laughs> who wrote the script for me. Um, Lane is a professor of political science at UNC Chapel Hill. Um, her research and teaching focus on international and comparative political economy, as well as international relations generally. Um, she's published two books and an edited volume and in all the major journals of political science and beyond. Um, but her research focuses on the connections between the global economy and domestic policy outcomes. Some of her work examines the effect of multinational corporations on workers' rights in developing countries, as we'll hear today, as well as the ways in which U.S. trade policies might affect workers' rights abroad. Other research, <laughs> I told you to get comfortable. Um, Stephen's very good. I mean, fabulous. Um, another stream of research focuses on the politics of sovereign debt and how professional investors evaluate and react to political institutions and government policy choices. Please join me in welcoming Professor Mosley. Thank you. That was nice. So um, thank you, Sarah, for that nice introduction. And, and seriously, thank you, Stephen, for setting up everything. And thanks to Mershon for having me. It's really nice to, uh, to come here and meet some new folks and also to see some old friends. Obviously, none of us is getting any older, but long time, I should say, um, friends. And so um, I'm going to talk today about some research that I'm doing jointly with Eddie Molesky, who's a Duke, uh, looking at um, the prospects for labor-related upgrading um, on the part of developing country firms. And the paper that I circulated is one that if you, if you looked at it, um, hopefully you thought it's pretty far along, because uh, it is. Uh, but it's, um, there's also a second piece that it's not in the paper that um, does some similar survey work, again in Vietnam, uh, to try to think about how firms respond to uh, the shift in expectations around the Trans-Pacific Trade Partnership, around, around TPP. So I'm going to talk a bit about the paper and its logic, and then spend a little bit of time talking about some of our newer data related to, uh, to TPP. Uh, and you'll see uh, with that new data that um, it's not entirely clear kind of what's going on and what we can sort of make of changes um, in firm responses, but there's some interesting patterns uh, there. Um, so, um, okay, so let's just carry on right through that. Who needs that? Okay, so uh, just to kind of get some things clear at the beginning, um, when we think about worker rights or, um, or labor rights, uh, we can think about a wide range of, um, of phenomena. So um, the International Labor Organization um, in 1998 sort of said, well, there are all kinds of conventions and treaties and norms governing worker rights. But if we want to focus uh, on the narrow set of these, that if these are sort of not protected, then other kinds of rights and conditions are also not protected, uh, we should focus on things like the rights of workers to form labor unions, uh, the rights of these uh, unions to bargain collectively, the rights of workers to strike. Uh, we also could think about uh, child labor, especially those um, child labor by the, by the sort of youngest and most vulnerable. Uh, we could think about forced labor uh, as well as human trafficking, and we could think about employment discrimination. Uh, so when one's sort of talking about worker rights, that's often kind of what's on the table. Uh, of course, these things do correlate pretty well with things like health and safety at work or whether or not workers are required to work overtime, if they're compensated when they do. Uh, and others would also look at something like whether there's a minimum wage legislation um, in law as well as in practice. Um, and we know... Um, that um, while there are a lot of conventions and treaties and many different kinds of efforts to protect worker rights uh, in, um, in developing countries, there are lots of violations of worker rights. And so uh, we could spend a lot of time thinking about um, violations of um, core labor rights, and we could think about uh, this in terms of legislation as well as practice. Um, but so I take part, this is just a picture from a couple of years ago, uh, looking at uh, the World Justice Project's uh, indicators of, of worker rights um, in many developing countries. And the point here is to, is to note that there's a lot of variation across countries, but also that in many countries uh, where this is a zero to one scale, uh, we see a lot of countries that don't even sort of make it halfway up in terms of protecting, uh, whoops, in terms of protecting workers. And so a lot of folks in political science and beyond have tried to figure out um, 
what drives labor rights outcomes in developing countries. And most of that work has focused on explaining cross-national or cross-national time series variation in outcomes. And not surprising uh, to probably any of us, um, many of the important determinants of worker rights outcomes are domestic in nature. So we know that all else equal, democracies have better labor rights outcomes than non-democracies. We know that left-leaning governments tend to do better uh, than, uh, than their right-leaning uh, counterparts. We know that sort of um, countries that are more developed economically tend to have better rights outcomes. And we also know that at least in terms of observing violations of labor rights, we tend to see more of those in countries that have a larger manufacturing sector. So this could be that violations don't occur as much in the rural sector, or it could be that we're having a, we have a harder time noticing those. So um, in addition to these domestic factors, um, there's also some evidence that um, the international economy influences labor rights outcomes in various ways. Uh, so for instance, Terry Carraway, um, along with uh, Mark Anner and Stephanie Rickard, have looked at the link between uh, IMF structural adjustment programs and labor outcomes. Uh, I've looked in some past work at the link between trade openness on the one hand and foreign direct investment on the other and labor rights outcomes where trade openness and subcontracting seem to be negatively related to worker rights outcomes, um, but FDI is positively linked with labor rights outcomes. Um, and then we also know that um, there's some evidence that um, non-governmental organizations can help to advocate for labor rights. They also, of course, can help us sort of better observe violations. And others would argue uh, that at least sometimes, including labor rights conditions in preferential trade agreements, uh, can serve to improve rights. And there's a big debate about whether or not that happens and whether or not PTAs with conditions uh, lead to uh, improvements in rights once the PTAs in place are in place uh, versus, well, maybe PTAs are good at convincing reform before the PTA is signed, but once it's in place, it doesn't do much. But in any case, we have some evidence that there's this other, these other international mechanisms that make a difference. And then finally, uh, we also have some evidence that uh, labor rights outcomes in one's peers, uh, either regionally or by income, uh, and in one's trade partners can be linked with uh, a country's labor rights outcomes. So we know that the determinants of labor rights are, um, are multiple, uh, and also that the global economy and global financial institutions uh, and uh, international agreements affect worker rights in various ways. Um, and as someone who's done work at this, um, this cross-national uh, time series level, I, I would say that, you know, on the one hand, uh, this gets us kind of part of the way there to thinking about how to measure and how to explain worker rights outcomes. Um, but it really obscures a ton of variation. So we know there's lots of variation in labor rights outcomes within countries. We might expect, for instance, that um, labor-intensive sectors are going to be more prone to labor rights violations because... Um, those firms are sort of more focused on labor costs as part of their overall cost, or they're less worried about retaining um, highly skilled workers. Um, and we might even think that even within industries, we're going to see some heterogeneity among firms in terms of how they treat their workers and what that means for, um, for worker rights outcomes. Uh, so the country level analysis is, is, is nice, uh, but it doesn't really get us um, to the causal mechanisms that are generating these outcomes nor does it really get us to being able to, to unpack some of the within-country variation that, um, that exists. So, so kind of keeping that in mind, um, if we want to move to the firm level, uh, then there is some literature uh, out there which suggests that under some conditions, uh, there are going to be some firm-level mechanisms that promote uh, the diffusion of labor rights, um, as well sometimes as product standards or environmental standards. And the general idea here is that under some conditions, uh, firms, um, maybe in developed countries, but especially developing country firms, are going to have incentives to improve their standards uh, because they want to service foreign markets and because those foreign markets demand higher standards. And if you know anything about uh, the environmental uh, element of this argument, uh, you're probably familiar with David Vogel's uh, so-called California effect. So Vogel was writing about uh, the situation in which the state of California uh, tightens its auto emissions requirements many decades ago. Um, and so California has stricter emissions requirements than the rest of the U.S. Um, U.S.-based auto firms as well as foreign-based auto firms confront this. And because California is, was about 20% of the U.S. auto market, uh, they decide that it makes sense to simply upgrade the standards, upgrade the emission standards, 
uh, for all the cars they sell into the U.S., right? It didn't make sense to run kind of several production lines based on selling to California or selling elsewhere. And so by virtue of increasing the standards in California, uh, you get a sort of an overall upgrading uh, that's done not by government officials outside California, but it's done through this kind of market mechanism. And so the California effect has kind of come to be known as kind of a, a shorthand for the trade-based diffusion of standards, right? And it's, in this case, it's about you're selling to a higher standards destination, and therefore you have incentives uh, to upgrade your standards. Uh, of course, we might imagine it could go the other way, uh, and that selling to a low standards market could lead you to sort of either not upgrade or, in fact, to reduce your standards. So that's going to be something that, um, that's kind of um, sort of motivating our logic when we think about developing country firms and labor rights. Um, there's other work that Asim Prakash and his colleagues have done uh, that also think about firms signing on to voluntary regulations or voluntary standards. Um, and again, the idea there is that you're a developing country firm and you want to signal something to your partners abroad. So you want to signal, for instance, that you have high quality products. You want to signal that you're producing those in an environmentally friendly or labor friendly way. Uh, you might be particularly interested in sending these signals when your own domestic regulatory climate is weak and so your partners abroad don't trust you. Uh, you might also be particularly focused on doing this when there's a competitive need to do so because other countries or firms in other countries are doing so. And you might also do this when um, you or your partners abroad are concerned about um, labor or environmental activists kind of putting the spotlight on you for not having uh, very good practices. Um, and so again, one way of dealing with this at the firm level uh, would be to adopt um, voluntary standards, which again could be in labor, could be in environment, could be around product quality. Um, and then finally, uh, it's worth sort of also thinking about the idea that multinationals themselves um, might sometimes uh, lobby their host country governments in developing countries to upgrade standards. And so this is something that um, we sometimes see when a multinational comes into a foreign country and they want to service the domestic market. They're competing with other domestic firms servicing that market. Uh, and they maybe have brought with them their sort of um, higher home country standards. Uh, and they want to constrain their local competitors to also have those higher standards. So uh, Ronnie Garcia Johnson, um, long in 2000, tells a story about um, US-based chemical companies in Mexico and Brazil engaging in this as a means of sort of restraining uh, competition from domestic firms. Um, and so that one might be more about multinationals that are overseas because they want to service overseas markets. Um, the first two are really about um, developing country firms that are involved in production for export and in global supply chains, and they have incentives under some conditions to upgrade their standards. And it's consistent with some other country-level work, uh, which finds that um, when your trade partners have higher um, standards, in this case, labor rights standards, uh, you are all else equal more likely to have higher standards. Uh, so, um, so I have a paper with, uh, with Brian Greenhill and Asim Prakash where we look at this uh, with respect to uh, collective labor rights. Um, and uh, Chris Adolph um, and um, Vanessa Quince and, and Asim have another paper more recently where they look at this with respect to African countries' rights outcomes and trade with China. So they kind of look at the other side about does increasing trade with China lead to a diminishing of your standards? And they find some mixed evidence for that. So this is getting us a little bit more of the, of the way toward thinking about these um, processes at the level of firms. Um, at least theoretically, we're thinking here about kind of firm level incentives uh, to improve standards. Um, but again, this work is empirically sort of focused at the country level or sometimes at the industry sector level within country, right? But we're still at a, at a somewhat high level of, uh, of aggregation. Um, and this is not at all unreasonable in the sense that it's hard to get firm level data on, on things like labor rights um, outcomes or labor rights uh, practices. Okay. Um, so what, what Eddie and I do uh, in this paper is, um, is come at this in a firm level uh, direction. And we're going to be looking here at firm attitudes uh, and not about firm behaviors. And we can talk about you know, that, that sort of distinction and, and why that can be problematic. Um, we're going to focus on firms that are based in developing countries. Uh, these are firms that are often um, at intermediate positions in global supply chains. 
So if we think about how things are produced in the global economy, we can think about um, uh, production chains that often have multiple stages. Uh, and at each stage, you often have numerous firms within each layer. So you have um, supplier firms that are diversifying their risk by producing for, for a series, a set of lead firms. And you have lead firms that are diversifying their risk uh, by having lots and lots of subcontractors. So many times, developing country firms are involved uh, in assembling final goods. Uh, this is true in apparel, footwear, electronics. Uh, they might also be involved in producing components, as in the, uh, as in the auto sector. Um, and these developing country firms might themselves be multinational. That is, they might be a firm in Vietnam that's owned uh, by a firm based in Korea. Uh, but they're often, typically, they're not owned by, by global lead firms. So they're not owned by Apple. They're not owned by Nike, uh, but they might be sort of owned by a foreign firm that is itself contracting for Nike. Uh, so Nike's a nice example because it's so visible and it's been so in the spotlight for the last 20 plus years around labor conditions. Um, Nike has um, actually now has about 670 factories worldwide. Um, it used to have over, over 900. It's actually um, reduced its supply chain somewhat. Um, Nike employs about a million workers in these factories. So Nike has direct employees in the US and Europe mostly, but almost everyone who works producing for Nike is not a Nike employee. Um, in Vietnam, where we do our study, Nike has 81 factories, um, and these employ an average of about 4,800 workers. And I mention this because these are really large by Vietnamese firm standards. So when I talk about the firms in our Vietnamese firm survey, um, the foreign-owned firms in Vietnam, uh, their median employment size is like 125 workers. So these Nike facilities are really, are really big. Um, and again, the biggest one of these is owned by Hansei, which is based uh, in, uh, in Taiwan and operates elsewhere in the region. You can also think about Foxconn, which is a contract um, electronics manufacturer with facilities in, in several countries. And so one thing that we're thinking about here is that you've got these developing country firms that are often involved in global supply chains. Uh, we have a world in which maybe 20% of the world's workers, um, this is hard to estimate, but maybe 20% of the world's workers are involved in supply chain production. Uh, and yet, in comparative international political economy, uh, we're just now starting to pay attention to these kinds of developing country firms. Right? We're just kind of thinking about how do they engage in global supply chains? How do they engage in political activity? Uh, how do we sort of understand um, their contribution uh, to a variety of outcomes, in this case, uh, labor rights. Okay, so that's, so that's our kind of, you know, we have this kind of theoretical as well as this kind of empirical argument for why it's important to focus on the, on the firm level. So what we argue in the paper is that the, the, the possibility of being involved in a global supply chain can create incentives for these developing country firms to undertake labor-related upgrading. So we're not saying it always happens, right? It's not always an optimistic picture. But con consistent with some of the work on global value chains, for instance, um, we sort of think that there is a possibility for some industrial upgrading, right? So for kind of moving up the kind of um, the value chain, but also for um, sort of giving a little bit more of the benefits of that value chain to workers as opposed to, uh, to, the, to the owners. Um, we also think that global supply chains can be places in which uh, there's, there's kind of extra pressure uh, on developing country firms to improve their practices. And so if you think about the corporate social responsibility movement, uh, which tries to pressure um, usually developed country-based large firms to kind of um, uh, do good with regard to social and labor and environmental outcomes, uh, it sort of says, you know, we're going to try to use activism to shame you if you don't do a very good job and to praise you if you do. And we're hoping this is going to create this material, this extra material incentive for firms to, uh, to sort of behave themselves, and also for firms to pay attention to what their subcontractor and supplier firms are doing. So there's some recent uh, evidence. Uh, Greg Disselhorst and Rick Locke have a piece coming out in the AJPS where they find, they look at, um, at, the, at the firms that help to connect uh, these developing country firms with, uh, with lead firms. Uh, and they find that these sourcing agents do seem to be attentive uh, to how well uh, the supplier firms do in their, in their compliance audits. So when it comes to thing like, things like labor practices. And so 
firms that do well on these compliance audits um, get significantly more orders than those that don't. So our idea here is that you know, there's some reason to believe that there are going to be incentives for developing country firms who want to take part in global supply chains to, uh, to improve their, uh, their labor standards. Okay, so if we start to disentangle why this would be the case, um, part of this is just, is, 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 it, well, it's all purely material in our, in our view, but the first material part is that these developing country firms want to service foreign markets. They know that foreign markets are going to offer them the promise of higher returns. And it might be, it, it's often the case they can earn higher markups in these foreign markets. Uh, they also sometimes realize that to be able to service these foreign markets, to be able to sort of um, provide output uh, at sort of um, high enough speed and high enough quality, uh, they may have to hire the most skilled workers in their local labor force. So part of what might be going on here is that you want to service uh, foreign markets. Uh, you need to hire the best workers in your economy. How do you hire the best workers in your economy? Well, you treat them reasonably well. You invest a little bit in labor-related upgrading. Uh, and I'm going to come back to this uh, in a second, but that's our kind of general claim about you tend to earn higher markups in foreign markets. We also have a more specific claim, which says that for many products, the markup you can earn in foreign markets varies across those different foreign markets. And so we're going to think a little bit about markups generally, but we're also going to think about markup differentials specifically. So for instance, um, I may have a greater desire and I might get a higher return servicing markets in the U.S. than I would servicing markets in China. And where that differential is particularly large, I'm going to really want to do the thing that's going to allow me to service the U.S. market as opposed to the Chinese market. And it's important to keep in mind that these markup differentials vary by product. Okay, so in some cases, the differential across foreign markets is very, very small. In other cases, it's quite large. And so we think that that differential is then going to, um, to cue firms to think about what do I have to do to service uh, this higher markup market. Uh, if I can get this big differential, I'll invest. Whereas if there's no differential, um, I'm not going to bother sort of making these kinds of investments in, in upgrading. OK, so that's all kind of in the realm of markups. The second thing that we think is going on is that there's a perception on the part of developing country firms that at least some foreign firms are aware um, of kind of social activism and pressures for corporate social responsibility. Uh, this could be because their shareholders are demanding uh, this, kind of, uh, this kind of behavior. This could be because maybe, I say maybe, I'm cynical here, uh, maybe consumers um, sometimes for some products in some countries demand these higher standards. Uh, it could be that labor rights activists have targeted certain sectors and certain firms. Um, and all of these things can, can combine to make labor-related issues more salient uh, in some sectors and, and for some firms. And again, the, the developing country firms that work in these, um, in these areas are aware enough of kind of global market dynamics to know when they're in an industry where that's going to be important and when there's going to be this kind of additional pressure, this additional incentive to engage in, uh, in upgrading. Okay, so we're really trying to look at the extent to which these mechanisms operate uh, to sometimes make firms uh, more inclined to invest in labor-related upgrading. Okay, so some of you may have wondered if I was a political scientist or not because I haven't had my two-by-two two table. So now we're done. So I've established my cred. Okay, um, so we, I just, this is just kind of repeating as I was sort of going through uh, that um, we have uh, the element of um, this markup differential, and we're going to think about this in terms of the differentials you earn in a, in a developed versus in a developing country. Uh, and we have this element of the salience of labor practices. And we're going to think that we're going to observe the most kind of willingness to invest in labor-related upgrading in places where there's a high markup differential um, and where there are very salient, there's a high salience of labor-related practices. So that's kind of the lower, the lower right-hand side. And this is least likely to operate in places where the differentials are small or non-existent and where labor practices are not very salient. Um, what's unfortunate about this table is that it's hard to find an economy that has all of these kinds of, of, um, of firms, or all these kinds of sectors of production. So if we think about specialization, um, we tend to have economies that have some of these kinds of sectors, or some of these activities, and not others. And so when we're thinking about the case of Vietnam, 
which is where we, where we have survey data um, at the firm level, we're really over here on the left-hand side of the chart. That is, um, that's not entirely true, but we're, we're, we're largely in a place where uh, we're going to see some variation uh, in salience. Um, we do have some um, variation in, in, in differentials, but what we're really able to look at is this variation in salience. And if, you've, if you look at the paper, you know that at the end, um, we sort of use this case study to talk about um, plastics, which is actually plastic bags in the case of Vietnam, uh, versus apparel. And we think about how salience matters, uh, matters there. What we expect in general, though, is that there's a combination of salience as well as markup differentials uh, that's going to affect firms' willingness to engage in labor-related upgrading. Okay, we have questions so far? It's like a lot of me talking. Okay, oops, okay. Okay, so um, if you happen to have read papers about Vietnam, which I know is probably not the thing that you spend your time doing um, in many cases, but... Um, you may know that, um, that uh, Eddie Molesky has, uh, for now, I think we're on year 13, has done a survey of um, both domestic as well as foreign invested firms in Vietnam. And this is a survey that um, asks firms about all kinds of things, um, so infrastructure and uh, tax policy and um, ease of registering a business, there's all, all kinds of things in here. Um, and this is a survey that is actually now used by the Vietnamese government to, um, to evaluate local government officials, among other things. Um, so this survey tries to sample foreign invested firms as well as domestic firms. It's actually a much larger sample for domestic versus foreign firms. I'll get to that in a second. Um, but in the 2015 survey, there was, there's already a labor section of the survey, as there has been for years, which asked firms about things like labor cost and... Uh, retention of workers and whether or not they have strike activity and all these kinds of things. Um, in 2015, though, we added a labor, a specific labor, labor upgrading question to the survey. So this is this survey um, includes about 1,600 foreign invested firms. Uh, they're not from all of Vietnam's provinces. The foreign uh, firm sample is based on those 14 that have significant levels of FDI, um, and this is out of a, a total of about 12 and a half thousand foreign firms there. So. It's sampling a good chunk of, um, of foreign firms every year. Um, and about two-thirds of these firms are involved in some kind of manufacturing activity. So when I show you the results, uh, we're going to focus on manufacturing firms. If you look at the broader sample of firms, things hold up, but manufacturing seems to be what's most, um, what's most relevant. Uh, a few of these firms are joint ventures, but most of them are wholly foreign-owned, foreign mostly by uh, firms elsewhere in the Asian region. And almost all of them say, we come to Vietnam because labor is cheap and good, right? And it's a kind of, it's, it's hard to know like what to make of these kind of questions where you can sort of say, you know, everything is great. Um, but they say, you know, we like it here because labor costs are low, but also workers are reasonably uh, productive. Um, these firms I mentioned are maybe small by our kind of, our, our sort of vision um, of a foreign, uh, a foreign owned firm, uh, but they are about three times larger on average than domestic firms. Um, and there are a few of them that are more than 1,000 workers, right? So these are sort of a little bit different than the domestic firms in the survey. Now, I mentioned that um, our data is from a survey, th this at least, of foreign firms. Um, and um, I want to say that our argument is really meant to apply regardless of ownership, right? We're thinking about firms that are inclined to take part in global supply chains. And I'm not sure that we care if those firms are foreign-owned versus being domestically owned. So here's a little, a, little, a little fun sort of piece of advice. So if you're doing a survey um, and you ask someone to put something on the survey, and even if you're um, Eddie who has tons of experience doing this, you want to make sure they actually keep the question on the survey. So the story here is that um, we had this long, this long um, vignette that we have on the survey. It was supposed to be on both the foreign and the domestic in 2015. And when we got the data back, Later that year, we couldn't find um, the, the item in the domestic uh, data file. And so we asked, and they said, you know, that was really too long. Mm -hmm. So they just dropped it and not told, um, not told, not even told Eddie. Can you believe that? I mean, we think he's like, so great. Are you taping this? Oh, sorry. Um, okay. No, just teasing. Um, we did, have, and we do actually have this for both domestic and foreign firms in 2016 and 2017. Um, but the reason the empirics are only about foreign firms is that those are the only firms that were asked this question. Okay, so, oh my gosh, I really want to like, keep going here. So if you want to know what these firms look like in terms of where they're from, 
um, or sort of what they do. We can come back to that in a second. Uh, but again, we're really focusing here on these, uh, on these manufacturing firms, and they are mostly from places like Japan, South Korea, China, Taiwan, um, a little bit less Singapore, a few from the US, very few firms from Europe or India, which is going to come up in, uh, in a second. OK, so here's what we do. We ask firms about their willingness. And these are firm managers who are getting these surveys. Um, so we ask these firm managers about their willingness to spend money on labor-related upgrading. And so that's, a, that's a, a contingent valuation. How much of your operating cost would you spend? And we, uh, it ranges from uh, less than 1% to more than 15%. Because when we ask folks who work in this area what these kind of, kind of labor code of conduct improvements might cost, those were the estimates we were given. So we we're trying to be somewhat realistic here. And then we have a survey experiment component here because some firms are randomly assigned to be told that they've been offered the chance uh, to be shortlisted to get a contract uh, with a multinational, and that multinational is described as uh, being European and servicing the European market. Um, others are assigned to um, the description that the company is Indian and servicing the Indian market. And so we're also, so we're kind of trying to think about this question of markup differentials by having some firms get the India and some firms get the Europe. And so our kind of general, general sort of expectation here is that when you hear about servicing Europe, you're, more, you're, you're willing to spend more on labor-related upgrading because you assume that sort of uh, European consumers as well as European firms care more about that. Uh, but also that specifically where the, there's a bigger markup differential for your product between Europe and India, you'll be particularly inclined to invest in upgrading. OK, so what do we find? Um, so we find that a lot of firms um, are inclined to give answers like 0, 5, 10, 15, kind of uh, sort of heaping at certain places. Uh, so we can, we can sort of make these, um, we can use the continuous measure, or we can sort of put these into bins. Uh, it doesn't matter for our, um, for our, our results. Uh, but what we find is that on average, firms are willing to spend, report being willing to spend about 6% of their operating costs um, on labor-related uh, upgrading. Whoa. Uh, and that there is a significant difference overall uh, between firms that get the Europe treatment and the India treatment. It's about half a percent uh, difference between, uh, between those two. Uh, and so we have sort of, sort of some evidence that we're sort of motivating some difference in responses uh, based on our prime around the location of the, uh, of the market. Now, I wanted, I wanted to have, leave enough time to say something about some of the more recent work we've done. So I'm not going to spend a ton of time on these results. Um, Stephen, who saw the slides, knows that there are many, 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 many more slides. Uh, and there are many sort of later on that we can come back to. Uh, but, uh, but, you know, there's, there's a lot of stars. There's a lot of numbers. Uh, if we look only at, um, uh, at exporters, uh, if we look at the full sample, if we use fixed effects by country, industry, sector, uh, we still find uh, an effect of our treatment, that is, of Europe versus India, on firms' willingness to invest in, uh, in upgrading. So just a couple more things I want to I wanna mention then. Um, something else we do, and, and I should say this is totally my co-author who did this, um, and I want to say that because it's really cool, is we were trying to, I think it's cool, we were trying to uh, get a good measure of markup differentials. So economists who, uh, if you're an economist, I'm sorry, um, economists who study this, uh, who study uh, markups and markup differentials, um, often study single countries. So they study what, what are the markups like by product in Belgium or in India. Uh, there aren't as many of these cross-country uh, markup studies. And where there are cross-country markup studies, there's not much of a willingness to share data. And so um, what we did instead was we got data from the Chinese Customs Authorities uh, for one year. Uh, and this data is at the eight-digit product level. So it's a very fine grain um, sorting out of, uh, of products. And um, China sells to India as well as to Europe. And we assume that the differentials that or the markups that Chinese firms um, can earn when they export to these markets are not that different from what Vietnamese firms can earn when they sell to these markets. And so we can calculate markup differentials um, across, uh, across products. Uh, and we, and we, we find when we calculate this, and then we look at whether or not this helps to predict willingness to upgrade, it does indeed. 
right? And so where that differential between um, what you earn selling to Europe versus what you earn selling to India is greater, uh, you report a higher, um, or you report that you're willing to spend a greater amount. And so all else being equal, of course, right? And so we have some evidence there for this markup differential kind of idea. Um, a second thing we try to do is we try to kind of get at the salience thing. So I, I sort of describe this in a very qualitative way, right? I can, I can think about apparel, I can think about footwear, maybe carpets. I can kind of think about examples where activists have targeted certain kinds of products and sectors, and that kind of raises the salience of these in world markets. And I can think about others that don't get targeted, but that's maybe not terribly satisfying. So one suggestion we got was, well, maybe what's really kind of driving salience is whether you're producing intermediate goods or final goods. And the idea there might be that final goods, you're really thinking more about, it's visible to the consumer or to the shareholder, and you might be thinking more about the, the way in which it's produced. Um, it's not great because, um, you know, I, I think that if you're a firm that's really come under the negative spotlight, uh, like some of the shoe manufacturers have in recent years, you actually might care about what's going on all the way down your supply chain, so you might care about your, your intermediates. Um, what we find is that intermediate, intermediate goods uh, production or, or share doesn't seem to be a very good predictor of this willingness to upgrade. So we try to kind of get at this because it's data that, that are out there, uh, but it's not really getting at salience. And in the paper, we fall back on saying, look, it's really hard to come up with some kind of quantitative measure by product um, of salience to activists. What we do instead is we just compare a couple of these sectors where we have a significant number of firms in Vietnam uh, and where we would expect to see some differences in salience. So this is just um, firms that fall into apparel in the red and rubber and plastic in the blue. I mentioned that rubber and plastic for Vietnam is uh, plastic uh, retail carrier bags. Um, trivia fact, um, Vietnam has been, was, was, before TPP, was blocked from getting a uh, generalized system of preferences status to the US, uh, in part because it's nominally a, t a communist country and in part because plastic bag manufacturers in South Carolina fought tooth and nail for years and years to keep Vietnamese plastic bags from getting trade benefits. So plastic bags are a big thing for Vietnamese manufacturers. Um, these are also a nice, this is a nice pair, because when we look at the markup differential data, uh, it's very, very similar, right? So we're kind of holding markup differentials uh, pretty constant and then comparing based on salience. What we see here is that the firms in the apparel sector that get the Europe treatment report being willing to spend quite a bit more than those that get the India treatment. On the plastic bag, and that, that difference is significant statistically. On the plastic bag side, though, uh, it's actually it's not a significant difference, and it's also the reverse of what we might expect. That is to say, firms are more willing to pay to service the Indian market, which maybe isn't surprising if you think about the fact that you know if, if you are in Europe and you ask for a plastic bag, um, you're either charged, you know, 20 cents for it or you're shot, depending on, no. okay, it's not funny. <laughs> All right, maybe. You really don't want to use a plastic bag when you're in Europe, right? And so firms that make this probably know that their market growth potential uh, is in India and is not in, uh, in Europe. Okay, so um, there's a lot more in the, in the paper in terms of the way in which we do this analysis. Um, we also can talk, of course, about the kind of hokiness of the survey experiment, about the extent to which reported willingness uh, to spend uh, is or is not the same as actual spending and, and how that slippage might, uh, might, be, might be addressed. Uh, but I wanted to spend a few minutes before we, before we get to comments and Q&A and say a little bit about some more recent survey work that we've done. So keep in mind the very, very same survey item, um, except for the countries that are named in that survey item are the U.S. and China. So we've replaced Europe and India with the U.S. and China. This, is a, a, this could be problematic because, of course, Vietnam has a, a, a contentious relationship with China and, of course, a, quite, a, quite a past with the U.S. And actually, that's part of why in the initial surveys we went for Europe and India uh, and not for China and the U.S. Uh, but in the 2016 and 2017 surveys, we asked both domestic and foreign firms about their propensity to invest in labor-related upgrading, and we named the U.S. And, uh, and China. And it just so happens that in between the time when these surveys were done, these surveys are done mid-year, um, in between the time when these surveys were done, 
the U.S. government announces that we're done with TPP. And so we thought it would be interesting to look to see whether or not, on average, the way firms responded to this, uh, to this prompt uh, changes between 2016 and 2017. And the background here is that um, TPP and the TPP negotiation process uh, received a lot of support from Vietnamese firms. So when you, we were, the Vietnamese firms were asked in 2014 and 2015 what they thought of TPP, and the majority of them are either very or somewhat supportive of TPP. Um, that being said, it was somewhat of a, of a contentious issue in Vietnam because the U.S. insisted on the inclusion of a labor chapter, Chapter 19, in TPP. And that labor chapter sort of said, you know, Vietnam has to provide workers with internationally recognized worker rights. That means they have to have the right to form unions. They have to have the right to collectively bargain. There has to be more than one sort of state-sponsored uh, state union. And it said that if they don't do this, right, we, we're not going to start TPP. And if, they, if, if TPP is launched and they screw up, uh, they can also be, um, be held to account. And so that was, a, that was a very contentious issue. And because the U.S. insisted on that with Vietnam and not so much with other countries involved in TPP, there was some discussion of why are we being singled out? Why don't you trust us? And ultimately, the Vietnamese Chamber of Commerce um, and the Vietnamese government sort of said, you know, we don't like this labor chapter, but access to the U.S. market is, so, is such a prize that we're willing to do it. Right? So we're going to kind of hold our nose and we're going to agree to this labor chapter in TPP, right? And so this idea of you have to upgrade your labor practices to get access to the U.S. market is kind of part of what's there in TPP. And we might think that, you know, as TPP disappears, uh, or at least the U.S. Ver the, the US included version of TPP uh, disappears, that firms kind of shift their, their opinion about labor-related upgrading. Okay, so I said all of that, so I don't have to now. Okay, so what do we see? Um, one thing I should say is that um, for the, the other thing that's different in the 16 and 17 surveys is um, we took out the tick off a box for the number and we just left it open ended. Um, and so uh, we, do have a, uh, we do have some chunk of firms that give kind of crazy answers in terms of percentage of operating cost. So um, here we, uh, we, we top code and anything that's more than 20% we, uh, we, make it, uh, we make it 20. Uh, we see the same kind of heaping, maybe not surprisingly. Uh, that happens around 0, 5, 10, 15, and, uh, and 20. But what I want you to look at uh, is uh, just two slides that um, one is going to be domestic firms and one is going to be foreign-owned firms. And again, these are going to be firms um, that are um, involved in manufacturing on the left-hand side and firms that are involved in construction on the right-hand side. And the reason I'm showing you manufacturing and construction is that um, the, our, the initial coding actually combines these things into the same, it, as the same sector. And when we sort of went back and looked at it uh, within that broad sector, we found that there was quite a difference between manufacturing firms on average uh, and construction firms on average. And so um, the left-hand bars in each panel are 2016, before, and the right-hand bars after are 2017. And then uh, the blues are those that get the U.S. treatment, and the reds are those that get the China treatment. And you really don't see much of a difference among domestic manufacturing firms between 16 and 17. Uh, where you see this big difference uh, is in construction firms. Uh, these are domestically owned construction firms. Um, and so you know, we can think about this being maybe, maybe these firms are thinking, once TPP is gone, our real prospects are with China. We can think about one belt, one road. We can think about all the sort of infrastructure projects. These may be domestic firms that are thinking not only about um, sort of you know, Chinese investment coming in, but thinking about supplying uh, Chinese firms. Uh, and so you do see this kind of big shift in construction. And I don't know enough about the construction sector at this point to really think about how labor issues play out there. Um, anecdotally, the construction, sec construction sectors in general are often places where there's lots um, of, uh, there are many problems with, uh, with worker rights. Um, here, Got the sort of the same thing, uh, but these are foreign firms. Um, these are again manufacturing and construction, and here there's really not much going on, which is to say, those construction firms that we saw before, um, when they get the U.S. treatment, are much more inclined to think about labor-related upgrading than when they get the China treatment. Kind of be what we, what we think about. Um, in 17, they report being willing to spend more to transact with China 
but it's still on average not as much as they say they would spend uh, to uh, to transact with the U.S. Right. So and so this is kind of truth in advertising. I don't know that we have anything here. Uh, I hope that we would find more when we looked at this because it seemed like such a nice accident. I mean. TPP falling apart for the U.S. is not a nice accident, but the fact that we had the before and after was it was it was a nice thing that happened. And but you know beyond that, we see different things happening on average with manufacturing and construction. Uh, it's not sort of clear what's what's going on, and we haven't done a lot to uh, yet to unpack these dynamics. Um, we know that it's medium-sized firms on average that have the biggest shift in sort of how they respond to the to the treatment between 16 and 17. Uh, we know that if we go back and we think about markups, um, we know that um, if you're in a sector with high markups, you're still willing to spend more to get to the U.S. market. Um, and uh, we also know that if you're in a low markup sector, uh, in 17, you become more willing to spend uh, if you're getting the China treatment. Uh, but beyond that, there's not, um, a, there's not a lot conclusively that we're able to say at this point. Okay. So um, let me, I've talked a long time, and so let me just conclude by saying, um, I've mentioned already that if we think about what to do with this in the future, uh, you know, there's, there's obviously the question of the kind of the external validity of doing a survey experiment. Um, and so, you know, we're not sort of going out and pretending like we are multinational location consultants and then seeing what firms actually do on the ground. Uh, there could be some expense as well as some ethical questions about doing that. Um, but we might worry about the extent to which managers say they would do something versus would they actually do it. Um, and that's obviously a big question about any kind of research that uses a survey experiment. Um, a second thing we might think about is other ways in which these developing country firms vary. So we've got data for the foreign-owned firms for the 2015 um, survey, but we don't have it for domestic-owned firms. We have that, of course, for this more recent round. Uh, we might sort of think again about other characteristics of the supply chain. So folks like Gary Giraffe, uh in the kind of value chain literature have thought about different kinds of supply chains that vary over time as well as by product. Uh, Mark Dallas is also doing some work on uh, trying to unpack what supply chains look like and thinking about how supply chain structures vary in ways that might matter for, um, for labor outcomes. Um, and we also, you know, we, we talk a, a bit about salience being related to consumer pressures or shareholder pressures, and we could maybe think a little bit more about how exactly those, um, those play out. Um, if you want to talk more about how those play out or about kind of private governance more generally, I'm also happy to talk about a little bit of work I'm doing right now on the, um, the Bangladesh Accord and the Bangladesh Alliance uh, and which firms sign on to that and which ones don't. But I will leave it uh, for now because I've talked enough.
updating, the upgrading their labor standards. So uh, I, I was curious about like how, how much uh, of the survey you can leverage to, to talk more about variation within mm -hmm. the system. Uh, the second point that I think is very important uh, in a political perspective is uh, how much international trade might uh, help in like uh, upgrading the this, this labor standards over the So uh, I was thinking about like how so activists need to be uh, more careful about like the, the targets they need to take because some are not being as like uh, salient uh, in terms of labor standards uh, as others. So uh, I was thinking about how, how, how that is probably a function of the politics, the domestic politics of these nation countries. So uh, the difference uh, we see may be due a little bit, uh, bit to that. Of course, you, you showed us that it doesn't differ too much, but uh, actually it increases uh, the significance when you put countries in effects. Uh, but I was curious about like how, how different that could be in terms of politics, the domestic politics of the countries that are involved in these uh, supply chains. Uh, third, uh, I was thinking about the, the, the survey experiment itself. Uh, it, it is about European and Indian uh, possibilities, basically, the, the two different codes of conduct that are going to be uh, taken into consideration by the firms. Uh, and I was thinking how much of that is markup? Uh, I think a lot. Uh, I think you could miss them. You convinced me on that, but how much is that uh, uh, a function of enforcement? So, uh, if, if the Euro European Code of Conduct is being presented to me, I'm probably more likely to think that this is going to be seriously taken into consideration by, by the European clients that I may have than the Indian uh, clients. So, that, dif dif that difference, I don't know how much you can like uh, take into consideration with the survey that you have, but maybe uh, a difference in enforcement may be as, as significant as the difference in markup. So I don't, I don't know if that makes sense. But yeah. yeah. Thank you again for the Sure. Thanks, Nisius. And, and so um, let, me, let me start in reverse order with your, with your questions. Um, so I think you're absolutely right to worry about what do, when a, when a firm manager gets the survey and um, he or she hears Europe, or she hears India, right, what is that queuing, right? And, and so our assumption is that um, it's queuing something about sort of the demands of that market, the demands of firms based in that market, given consumers and shareholders and maybe the domestic regulatory environment. Um, but that might not, oh, and it's also maybe queuing these markup differential um, qualities. Um, but that might not be the only thing that's going on, right? And so it might be, for instance, so one reason that we're, um, you know, if we, um, if we toss out those firms that are owned by a European uh, investor or by an Indian investor, that doesn't seem to matter, right? And there's not many, many of those anyway. So, so that's maybe a, a little bit um, to address it. But I think more important, I think you're right that um, it may well be that what I hear when I hear Europe is, oh, that's a place where if I transact with that firm, uh, they're going to keep their promises, right, in terms of kind of the sanctity of contract law, right, or the, the rule of law. Um, or that when I, you know, I hear India, maybe I think, well, I can say whatever. No one's going to come in and monitor me, and so I can. It, it's not going to matter very much. I'm not going to be held to held to account. Um, and I think it's difficult for us to, to do much about that. Um, I mean, I think in a, you know, in a in an ideal world, we would um, we would we would deploy this survey and then sort of go and talk to some of these managers and sort of say, like, what do you what do you think when you hear this, right? And are we getting at what we think we're um, we're getting at? I will say that um, India passed a CSR law in 2014 requiring, um, requiring their firms to sort of uh, engage in and report on their sort of uh, social responsibility activities. And that got a lot of press, at least in India. I don't know how much press that got sort of elsewhere you know, in the region, including in Vietnam. But that might work a little bit against this kind of this claim that, well, I don't, I'm not going to take this seriously with respect to, uh, to India. But I think that your concern is perhaps even more uh, pronounced when we start talking about China, right? So, like, what does it mean, right? What do I if, I, if I hear that a Chinese firm has a labor code of conduct for suppliers, what do I, what do I, what do I think, right? Do I think that's just complete window dressing, or do I think, well, whatever is in there is kind of not core labor rights? And so, I think that's certainly something that's worth, um, worth, worth worrying about. Um, I also think that you know this, this question about, um, you know, when do consumers care, 
right, is, a, is, a, is, a, um, is an important one. Um, and so uh, Tim, Tim Bartley, who was here uh, at Ohio State um, for a while, you know, has this work on thinking about, Bartley and Child have this work about thinking about when do activists target certain kinds of sectors and certain kinds of industries, right? And that they're making these strategic decisions uh, about, you know, where, where are we going to get the biggest bang for our buck, right? And where are we going to get sort of traction? And, you know, the kind of, one of the, the long-standing things is that uh, this assumption, for instance, that European consumers are generally more sensitive to these kinds of issues than U.S. consumers, um, that consumers who are purchasing luxury or branded products are more sensitive to these kinds of things. Um, but, you know, that, that still leaves quite a, quite a range. And, you know, we're not able in our, um, even at our, with our product level data, to know is this something that's at the high end of the consumer market within apparel or at the low end of the market. And that might give us a little more purchase if we, I don't think we can in this survey, but if we could, if we could, uh, if we could get at that. Um, but maybe the flip side is also that um, if activists were a little more attuned to some of these, these kind of differentials dynamics, maybe they would make slightly different choices. I don't know. Um, the other thing I would just say is, you're right, that there's a lot of, um, there are a lot of other firm features we have in the survey. Um, and I could, if you, if I, I could show you this nice balance table, right, where we look at all these potential confounders, right, all these, all these different things we know about these firms to check for balance in the survey. Um, and um, I think there's one, uh, one of those where we see significant differences across the two treatment groups, kind of what we would expect um, based on chance out of a set of about 20. Um, but it's funny because we had a bit of this little like co-author disagreement where I would sort of say, well, let's account for this and this and this and this and this different kind of feature of firms and see if it matters. Um, and, and, and my co-author was sort of like, no, like this is, a, this is an experiment, right? And the research design is we randomly assign, right? We, ass we assume there's balance and we're not going to deal with those confounders. And it's kind of cheating a little bit, right, to expose, kind of go in and, and adjust for those things. Um, but but I, I completely take your point that we might expect, for instance, that, um, that you know, maybe firms that have come into this more recently, I mean, you could, it, could, it could go either way, right? It could be that as firms become more experienced, they figure out a little more sort of what they ought to do. Um, or it could be, so older firms might behave differently and, and, and be more inclined to upgrade. Or it could be that newer firms have kind of come up uh, in this kind of different environment where there is perhaps more of a focus um, on these kind of um, social issues and that they're more willing to do it. Um, we do, we do uh, account for the fact in our analyses that, um, that firms that are in the same province are not really independent of one another. So when we sort of think about the standard errors, right, we're sort of dealing with that uh, in, terms of, uh, in terms of clustering. Um, but but, but I, I completely take your point that there are probably all kinds of other firm attributes that are probably going to affect the willingness to upgrade that go beyond uh, what, which kind of treatment you're getting in the, in the survey. Yeah. Yeah, Marcus.
But the other axis is cost in terms of the ephemeral or durable character of the product mm. I'm buying, and that's where the quality control is interesting. Um, because if I'm, the cup of coffee only lasts a while, even the garment, the quality matters, but it doesn't matter as much. Um, I can spend more on my personal integrity when it comes to mm. buying a cup of coffee than buying my computer, which has to be good, it has to be what I'm used to, it has to work mm. for me, and so in fact I am going to overlook and I have overlooked Apple's labor practices because... You love your Mac. Right. Yeah. Right. 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 So that, that kind of distinction between the ephemeral, and it puts garments in the sweet spot, I think, right. for activists. Right. I have some thoughts, but let me take Chris's question first, and then I'll come back. So the, the title of the paper is about uh, diffusion of labor practices, but the, the whole thing is framed in terms of basically a developing country looking at export markets and mm -hmm. how that might hold up, which is the happy good news story. Mm -hmm. um, I'm wondering if you uh, could talk a little bit about the flip side of that story and um, what are the effects if, if labor standards are diffusing, is there their pressure downward on the countries that are imp on, that are importing these products in terms mm. of their manufacturing sector, um, mm -hmm. and has anybody done like a survey experiment like this in U.S. markets, looking at um, at manufacturers who are facing import competition from these kinds of countries, and uh, you know, do they do they feel downward pressure on labor standards? Right, absolutely. Okay, shall I take those? Um, so, so uh, both of the the first two are really about or consumers and that and that mechanism and you know I, I, on apparel I would say that that's probably true for some apparel right and so for some consumers of some apparel this idea of um, I care how my clothes are made and this is part of my identity or this is sort of you know something I'm gonna see this in my closet every day and I want to think about oh it's it's sweatshop free um, and that was of course at the core for instance of the movement on college campuses right to sort of certify collegiately licensed apparel as sweatshop free um, but the flip side is that we also have a lot of mass market apparel where I think that that's, it's really about fast fashion. Uh, it's really about price. And so if one is buying their clothing, I mean, I was, was say H&M, right? H&M now has an H&M conscious level, that, right? It's a little bit uh, more expensive, uh, right? But it's, but it's, you know, it's still the kind of fast fashion consumerist kind of, kind of thing. And, and so, and so I, I don't know, you know, I, I'm a little, to, and this kind of ties to Marcus's question, I'm a little cynical about the consumer pressure mechanism as the thing that's really gonna that's gonna that's gonna drive this. Um, so I think you're right, Marcus, that it's really it's it's kind of hard to separate out. You know, is this a reaction? Um, is this a means of kind of shortcutting how do I assess quality, or is this something about sort of consumer well consumer shareholders act with someone is demanding this? Um, and I think in some ways the way we're thinking about it is that it is more a story of. Um, for some kinds of products, uh, you're going to get this upgrading. Maybe not. Maybe it's 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 made more likely by that salience and activism. But what's really setting it off is that markup differ differential. And what that suggests is that it's really going to be uh, it's going to vary a lot by product. And for some products, you're probably not going to get that. Um, and so, you know, I, I don't think in the survey we could look at at, at commodities just because the sur the survey itself is really aimed right at firms engaging in some kind of manufacturing or services activity and not around agriculture. Uh, but you're right that if you thought about consumer attitudes and behavior, that might be a place that one, one could go. I always think, when I start talking, I always think about the, the papers by, uh, by Jens Heimuller uh, and Michael Hiscox around, um, around consumer behavior. And um, there are a couple of great findings in there. And so you know, one is that when they put up signage in Banana Republic stores, and they, 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 they have this whole matching of stores, whatever, right? But, when they do this, when they, uh, when they put up signage that labels something as being kind of made in an environmentally friendly way or made in a labor friendly way, um, you get an uptick in sales compared to no signage. When you put up something that says this is super fashion forward, you get an uptick in sales um, compared to no signage. And so basically the finding is people like signs, right? But it's not clear, right? And unfortunately in, in that study, they don't do a combined this is very fashionable and it's great for the environment and workers, right? But you sort of wonder, like, what are people really responding to there? But the, the one I really love is fair trade coffee at Whole Foods, right? Where, you know, when they, when they label coffee fair trade and it's the same price as the, as the other coffee, nothing happens. But when they label coffee fair trade and they raise the price by a dollar a pound, sales go up. So it goes to this sort of like, well, if I have to pay more for it, I must be helping things. 
So I'm, I'm, I'm a little like cynical about the consumer behavior as a, as a, um, as a direct mechanism. That being said, um, I was talking earlier about doing a little bit of work on um, which firms that are producing apparel in Bangladesh have signed on to one of the private governance initiatives and which ones don't. And one of the things that we find is that um, firms that are publicly traded are more likely all else equal. Uh, and firms that you know, are, um, have some more of a business in Europe are more, are, more equal, are more likely to sign on, right? So I think there is, probably are some broad differences uh, in terms of either shareholder or consumer attention to these kinds of things. Uh, but I think that, I think probably it's really the differential that, that's, that's behind this. And it's really kind of a more, a more materialist story. Um, Chris, you know, I mean, I, when you start asking your question, I was thinking, well, yeah, there's lots of papers on things like the China shock. I mean, if, we, if we really want to think about you know, the, the implications of um, you know, trade competition um, and uh, trade, in, trade, um, trade induced dislocations and how these reverberate in domestic economies, right? And you know, so, so Alter Jordan and Hansen would say, well, you know, economic theory says we ought to get, you know, eventually, over the medium term, we ought to get adjustment. We ought to get workers maybe being retrained, maybe relocating. Um, what we find instead is that for those places that experience a surge of imports from China, uh, adjustment is really slow. And um, one of the things that, happen, that, that, that we see is that the mobility of those workers is pretty low. So workers are unlikely to sort of move to a different region you know, to maybe get these new jobs. Um, and workers aren't getting a lot of trade adjustment assistance, for instance. Um, to the extent that they're getting government assistance is actually mostly in the form of disability payments. Um, and there's some, actually some really interesting domestic politics in this. Um, uh, so Christoph Pelk has a paper about um, which, which counties in the US, based on that same data, uh, get more trade adjustment assistance. Because the way you get this assistance is um, you file claims. And firms can file claims. Um, and workers can file claims. But often their awareness that they can do this kind of comes from their political officials. And so one of their findings is that where your member of Congress is a Democrat, uh, we tend to all to get higher sort of um, higher assistance to those places. Um, but certainly what, what that, that sort of research program at least suggests is that the adjustment to trade shocks is not as quick uh, as, one, as one would hope it is, right? And so you do have this, this effect on the other side. Um, and of course, I mean, you, you spend time in North Carolina. So if we think about the North Carolina economy, right, and sort of who, who has won and who has lost um, over time, uh, you can see big differences depending where in the state you are and what sector you're in. So. Yeah. Yeah. So, um, so just as a as a background, um, the survey does ask um, it asks firms about things that are very they're, they're maybe more innocuous about how well trained they think their workers are and sort of what turnover is like and that kind of thing. Um, but it does also ask about um, strike activity. Um, it asks whether or not a union exists in the firm, and it asks um, when it asks about strike activity. It also asks. Um, how was this handled, and to what extent do you believe the workers' claims were legitimate? So, so I, I'll, I'm going to get to your question in a second, right? But what I would just say that's interesting is that one thing, one pattern that's true overall over many years is that foreign-owned firms tend to report higher levels of strikes, unionization. They tend to see these demands as more legitimate than their domestically-owned counterparts. So, and 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 that's true whether you're a foreign-owned firm that has a Vietnamese manager or a foreign-owned firm with a foreign manager. So. At least there's probably, I, I don't know what that means, but that's just there as background. Um, we, do, we do ask them, when we have this long question where we describe this, um, this hypothetical labor code of conduct for suppliers. It looks like a lot of actual labor code of conduct for suppliers. Um, and it does talk about representation. Uh, it also talks about health and safety, overtime work. And so it's got a little bit of the collective rights, but also some of the um, individual stuff. I would say that in Vietnam, by 2015, there's a lot of talk about collective worker rights. 
There may not be a lot of sort of willingness to provide them. There's a lot of pushback going on there. Um, but there is certainly an awareness, I think, especially on the part of these more, um, more foreign involved firms, that there are these international standards out there uh, that um, there's a concern that because of its single union structure, Vietnam does not meet those international standards. And there's this kind of pressure around, you're going to have to do this to get into TPP. Because that's not something that comes in. I mean, by the time firms are being asked in 14 and 15, what do you think of TPP? They sort of know that that's kind of part of, that's going to be part of the deal if it happens. And so, so I, I take your point that um, when I hear collective labor rights here, or I hear it in Sweden, I probably hear it differently than, if I, than, than, than how I hear it in Vietnam. But I do think that there is, there is a, some sense of what that means uh, in that context, even though it kind of represents what they're not doing and what they're being told they should be doing, as opposed to representing what they are doing. That still may not answer your question, well, but, I mean, you know. I, 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 <laughs> Those posts get taken down. Yes. Yeah. So you've been paying attention this whole time. That's great. <laughs> well, you know, I don't know. That's right. survey experiment for what you're really supposed to use a survey experiment for. So you're not controlling for things like, you know, does this industry have organized labor in it? Mm. Does this industry have a code of conduct? You know, and things like that. Mm. Um, but I guess since that's not part of the project, I'll get ask you a question about the project. Um, the uh, the um, social responsibility bias possibility. Um, I thought it was interesting, and you did mention it uh, in the paper, but it made me wonder, when they're getting this survey, is it saying, you know, this is from USAID, like what, who do they think the audience is, who do the respondents think the audience is? Mm -hmm. And I understand that you're mainly just looking at the difference right. between these two treatments, right. so it's not like a huge issue. On the other hand, if the responses are all kind of inflated, you might be seeing bigger differences, whereas if they're all kind of muted, Yeah. So I'm just wondering what, what they're seeing when they get the survey. Sure. Um, so a couple yeah. things. I mean, one is that, um, the, uh, to me, the real question is, if there is some kind of social desirability bias, um, is, it, is it systematically greater when you get one version versus the other? Right? Because, because I would fall back, because to some extent, right, if you fall back on the internal validity point, then it's like, maybe do I care more about that difference right. Right, based on two different treatments, or do I care about the absolute level? Right, and in a kind of contingent valuation, kind of this is really an, a, a general sense of firms, I care about the level. But in a sort of how much am I thinking about this mechanism of the differential service in different markets, I care about the difference between the groups. Right, and, and so maybe you would say, well, I care about both. So, right, so I think well, that. I'd say the difference might be partly a function of the levels, but anyway. Right, okay, so I think, so, so my sense of this is that um, managers and managers are, no, are well, that especially among the foreign investment sector in Vietnam, this thing has been around long enough that people know what it is. So when we were, when we were in Vietnam recently, we heard these kind of funny stories about sometimes firms get upset because they don't get sampled, right? It's like, you know, somehow it's, it's become, like, it, it, that early on when this was first created, right, this was kind of jointly done and funded by USAID and the Vietnamese, Vietnamese Chamber of Commerce. And there was early on apparently more resistance to this, right? Like you're going to collect data and you're going to tell us like who's doing well and who's doing not so well. And you know, I'm a firm, so it's not going to directly sort of affect me, but it might affect the provincial officials with whom I, I deal on a, on a regular basis. And so maybe, maybe I, I just have mixed feelings about it, right? Whereas now, it seems to be this kind of thing that like it's known, it's out there, um, and there's a, there's a sense of I should respond. 
right? Um, but also, um, th this is kind of part of being a firm in this, in this place, is to, is to get this survey to do it. So I don't know what that means in terms of the content of the responses, right? But I think that it is, it is um, it's perceived as being something that's not only about some foreign group coming in, uh, it is also, and indeed, um, it's all, my understanding is, it's all run in a way that looks very Vietnamese, right? I mean, well, what I mean by that is it's, it's the local partners who are doing the, the sort of on-the-ground work. Um, I mean, they're, they're the ones who are sort of sending out the surveys, sending out the follow-up, these kinds of things. And so I think there's a, my sense is there's, a, there's an effort to, to make it seem not like, hey, here's the U.S. government funding the survey, and more, hey, here's something where the, govern the, the national government is interested in, its, uh, in the capacity of Vietnam as a whole to attract investment and to upgrade via foreign investment, and they're specifically interested in sort of how you're experiencing Vietnam. So, um, and so I don't know what that means in terms of then, what would you say? Because the other kind of question is, you know, to what extent do these managers kind of think, oh, if I say 17%, then some multinational is going to come contact me. Like, is this, a, is this a real thing, right? And again, that could be going on in some situations, but my guess is it's not going on much of the time uh, for these respondents, and it shouldn't be affecting the difference between those groups, I think. Yeah. I just want to say one interesting question kind of following up on the whole issue of labor rights versus individual rights. Is, uh, like, especially in the context of Vietnam or in China, there's actually, there's been, you know, as we know, several decades of communist party leadership, which does have a to include strong ideology of labor rights. So it's interesting to consider if there's actually more sensitivity to labor rights, at least as a concept, compared to mm. broader questions of the press and so on, for those countries. So, and so how would that, how do you think that would matter for the results? Uh, it might be something they actually just think about more often. So yeah. Compared to, say, India, which might be more heterogeneous to the question about labor rights. Right. Right. Yeah, I mean, it is, it is, it is interesting to think about because these are, these are uh, China and China before and then Vietnam more recently, you know, has, has made these changes to their labor code, right? And these are changes that are supposed to be sort of coming more into line, if not in line, but more into line with uh, internationally recognized labor rights. Uh, and yet there's always this big question about well, to what extent are you providing these in law but not providing these in, in, um, in fact. Uh, and, you know, it's also, it's also true in, uh, I was talking about Bangladesh at lunchtime today, right, where part of the changes post Rana Plaza are about reforming the labor code, making it easier to register unions, uh, but the law gets kind of changed, the practice doesn't change at all, right? And so I think we also have to think a lot about the gap between law and practice in many, in many of these countries. Um, and indeed, some of the early work I did about the trade-based diffusion of labor rights, um, we find more evidence for um, trade being a mechanism for the diffusion of legal changes to your labor rights as opposed to on the ground de facto changes in your in your labor practices. And so that kind of gets at that too. Do you have a question? Yeah. So you know, I'm pretty interested in uh, I was wondering, are there anything going on from the labor side? Because in your picture, if you were mm -hmm. asking questions to managers mm -hmm. and how they're responding to the market conditions. So labor standards, yeah, can be a function between the interaction between those managers and that the labor too. And I think in your picture Mm -hmm. Usually, those bigger bigger factories are the place where the labor movement is getting strength, right? So yeah. Are there anything going on right there? Yeah. So, um, so you're absolutely right. So we don't we don't have any survey data, right, or interview data of of workers and sort of how they're how they're experiencing this. I mean, we know that you're right about sort of the capacity to organize could be greater, um, either because you know your your ability to sort of act collectively is, is, uh, is greater, or because I think sometimes these firms do, are a little more willing for, as I mentioned, to allow labor unions to operate, to sort of think about these as, as, a, um, as, a, as a means of kind of allowing workers to air their grievances. Um, that being said, um, I, I mean, I, I, I do, what would I say? Actually, I'm not, I'm, not sure, I'm not sure what else we could say kind of systematically about it. Um, I, would, I would guess that we, we would see, if we had the domestic survey data and asked the same thing, my guess is we would probably see domestic firms reporting less willingness to engage in upgrading. We see that in the 16 and 17 data with, that, with a different prompt. Um, 
but that there's maybe more kind of concern about you know, labor, giving into labor demands in these domestic factories, which tend to be kind of less efficient, less competitive, uh, might be a bigger cost hit than sort of doing this in some of these, in some of these foreign firms. Um, but I think what we, don't, what we don't have at all is some sense of to what extent, for instance, do these workers, um, you know, are they aware of, you know, we're working for a multinational, they have these codes of conduct, or how do we, how do we act? Um, and I was, um, I was saying at lunchtime, you know, one of the things I'm sort of working on is getting some, um, some data from Bangladesh where one of the um, private standard um, uh, entities, the Alliance, operates a worker hotline. And so then you can sort of begin to sort of think about, well, who actually calls into the hotline? What do they report? So are, they, are they willing to report some things and not others? Um, are they, you know, are certain kinds of workers more or less likely to report? Do they follow up? These kinds of things, right? So getting at that kind of micro-level worker uh, dynamic is certainly important, but we just don't have it in, uh, in, this, in this context. Yeah. Oh, sorry. Yeah. <laughs> No, I mean, I, you know, just kind of, and just very impressionistically from, um, from, from being in Vietnam recently, I think that there's a lot of worry about um, sort of their, their ability to keep attracting investment and kind of where they fit in the, um, in the regional or kind of global competitive space. And so I think there's this kind of, on the one hand, you know, they've attracted tons of, of FDI, right? Sort of they, they kind of way, uh, way outperform uh, what one would expect, and they've had really high rates of economic growth. Um, second only to China, and, um, and there's this kind of worry about whether or not that's sustainable. And I think part of the worry is this kind of question of, are we going to be undercut by competition from places like um, Laos or Cambodia or Burma, right? And, you know, I think in some ways Vietnam has escaped the kind of being Bangladesh, which is to say, you know, there is a perception that the labor is of, is of greater quality, but I think there's also this worry about, well, to what extent um, are we able to kind of move up the ladder? Right, and this kind of we're, we're going to be squeezed from either side, and um, and because you do, um, you know, again, anecdotally, hear some foreign firms complaining a bit about, well, yeah, the, you know, the, the labor's pretty good and pretty inexpensive for kind of unskilled and sort of like maybe like you know mildly skilled labor, but it's not great if we want to sort of move up to the kind of semi-skilled, right? And so I think there's a there's a lot of concern about, um, you know, to what extent have we kind of maxed out our ability. Uh, to attract investment and to do production, and are we sort of facing more competition now? And so, you know, in that kind of environment, one could imagine that, you know, things like um, we're going to be involved in supply chains with Chinese firms, right? You know, that could, that could sort of cut against this, right? And so my sense is probably that internally it's, it's a mixed bag in terms of whether or not that's really being pulled up. Um, but there may be some of these external pressures, again, for kind of some products and some sectors uh, might be sort of pulling them in that, in that way. And I actually think that this is one of the, the, the unfortunate things about, um, about the way that, that um, the TPP has played out is that that, you know, I mean, I, I, you know, I, I can be somewhat cynical about whether or not those labor standards and PTAs get enforced, but that was probably a good opportunity. Like, if, to the extent that it was possible, that was going to make it more possible, right? And this kind of, again, this tying market access, right, to upgrading was probably a really good chance to do that. And that's, you know, it seems to me that it's going to be really hard for the U.S. to go back into TPP if we do uh, and sort of say, oh, by the way, can you do that stuff again, right? But that's kind of a, a, a missed thing. But I think that those kinds of, those external mechanisms are not always perfect, but they, they can sometimes pull these countries along when they're sort of trying to decide, like, do we go low road or do we go high road in this? Okay, thank you all for coming and thanks for your questions.